I thank you all for having me uh, in to, to show you something that hopefully you haven't seen before, but if you have, you might learn something new. I don't know. I know that uh, looks like we've got a lot of experience out here, and, and I may be preaching to the choir to some extent, but my goal with the demonstration was to talk about taking, taking your projects to the next step by adding some kind of uh, embellishment to it of some sort. And with me, I tend to work with either color or texture or a little simple carving. Uh, those are kind of the three things and a lot of times I'll use them in combination. Um, so in talking about, you know, I, I, especially for the new turners, it's, it's, it's very hard to take a project that you're, you're, you're satisfied with, you're really happy with your end result, and then take it to that next step where you're taking something into it and, and you think I'm going to destroy it. But it's a way to set your projects apart from other projects. It's uh, using color, using texture, um, carving techniques when, when they can. I'm cheap, <laughs> so I don't go out and buy the high dollar pyrotechnic pins that, that, you, that a lot of people use in like the basket weaving and stuff. I use a, this was about $15, but that might have been about 15 years ago, so they're probably 20, 25 now, but it's a simple kit. Um, it's got an adjustable uh, source of heat, so I can kind of, gener uh, depending on what wood I'm burning in, I might not need it as hot as others, but usually I end up, I don't know, I usually end up at the pretty hot range which is the red area on there um, I turned it on right now so you guys keep with me and remind me that it's on <laughs> when I get close to it um, I use that a lot in just adding embellishment to a project um, but I'll, I'm gonna start out talking about color and so Mel if you can switch over I've got some slides of, of different things that that I've done and some kind of points in, on color. Um, many types of paints and dye uh, and even Sharpies can be used to add color and interest. I tend to uh, like dyes for color. I've got both the powder kind and then the, the liquid kind. Um, you can mix them. Most of them are made to mix with water. Some of them are made to mix with alcohol or water. You can use other kinds of things. I like alcohol because it dries faster. It, it uh, don't have to wait for it. You got uh, Sharpie. I use Sharpie as a last detail on, on this object. And basically it's just a, it's, it was a, a spherical box that I'd turned and then I took it over to the disc sander and just put many facets on it. And then I went back with dyes and colored the facets different colors. And the edges didn't really stand out, the, the division between them. So that's when I went back and got a Sharpie and, and uh, just kind of highlighted the edges um, to kind of isolate it, make it kind of look like stained glass. It gets a lot of looks. A lot of people say, why did you use white? My wife, in fact, said, why did you use white? That's too bright, man. But it catches your eye, it pulls you in, and that's, yeah. that's kind of what I was after. Um, I like to use light colored woods whenever possible. Um, open pore woods work real well because they'll soak in that, that color really well. Sometimes you get a maple piece and it just doesn't take the color and it's just because there isn't a lot of pores to suck it in as well. You do have to watch the side grain is going to take stain or take color differently a lot of times than your end grain and your end grain will pull it through like a straw so if you've got an item that you don't want the color to come through it say you wanted color out here but you didn't want color to show up here um, use a drier process in applying your your color on the outside to keep it from soaking through that end grain found that to be helpful um, when and, and I can tell a lot of you already know this, but those dyes when you put them on a buffer 
they really get to shine you know they they'll really pop and really really shine up so they, they I, I really enjoy using those um, I've used the sharpies for touch up um, and I have to kind of watch what you use the sharpie on because like a sanding sealer will pull sharpie right off of your piece if you you put sanding sealer across it um, you can if I rubbed on the edges of those, I could rub the Sharpie right off of it. So it's not uh, as permanent as you would think if you've already got a finish on it. Um, otherwise, it's going to soak into the wood and you're going to have the finish going right into the wood, which is fine too. It, um, let's see. I like color when you don't have to color between the lines. This piece over here is an example of, you know, I've got one burned line down at the bottom and some burned lines going up to make the tree trunk and then just splotch some green on there and let the other purples and reds kind of down there to establish a base but uh, versus the hollow form that I started out with this really kind of made it pop. Um, Mel if you can go to another another slide there Uh, here's an example. I saw Jimmy Clues do this at the symposium where he was taking colors um, with a with an aniline dye and it was a, a alcohol based mix and he would put the dark color on and he would light it because it was alcohol it would burn and it would bring up the fibers and then he'd sand those down and then put the light color excuse me, it was the backwards. He put the light color on first and then when he sanded it down, it came back with the dark color. To and, and the only thing that sucks in that dark color then is the grains and side grains that were exposed when he sanded down the, the light color that he started with. And go to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> this is a sphere that I had a buddy, a partner that I bowled with and he had a bowling ball that had that eye on it. And I found the eye online and decided I was going to uh, create spheres with eyeballs. So if you go to the next one, it's the same thing, only um, it's a, that is a chameleon, or no, not a chameleon eye, that's a lizard eye. And then the next one is a dragon eye that I saw a form of. And so that's got color, it's got some wood burning in it. I think I even used some white out to pop that little circle out of the middle of the eye to give it a little shine. Um, Mel, if you could go to the next one. Here is a, I had a hollow sphere that I had done. It wasn't perfectly round. It wasn't anything very exciting. And then something popped in my head and I said, I could make a globe out of that. And so I actually, uh, every part of that comes apart. You can peel, pull it all apart. It's about five pieces. And the, I tried to use the, uh, in the desert areas, I tried to let the wood color come through and use the green and darken it up in the areas where it would be more foresty and stuff when I was looking at it on the map. Um, and was really happy with, with the end result. It actually spins around. I gave that to my son, who's an elementary school teacher, and I think he keeps it on his desk. If you go to the next one. This one is a, I had seen a demonstration by Trent Bosch on a, is the Vessel of Illusion. You might have seen it done mm -hmm. before where it's got a, you actually uh, do your hollow form. I, it has two bends to it so that you can kind of get those leaves where one's bending out and one's bending in. And you just take away from uh, the opposite part as you're with the form you have and then it, don't know, do I have another slide of that one? The next slide? Yes. So inside that, I've got a cherry cap that was literally just a cap, and it, it's the right diameter that I, I boiled it in water so that it was a little bit squeezable, and squeezed it in there, and then put a balloon inside of it and blew it up so that it would glue and, and glue to the top. And then I just... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't going to be a flower when I started, it was going to be a vessel of illusion, but when I saw it, it was like, oh, this kind of looks like a flower, and so I added some bamboo sticks in the center, and, and I had some diamond wood that was pink, and uh, turned the little balls of, uh, to go on the ends of the skew, or on, on the ends of the uh, wooden skewer, and 
Then my daughter told me in the middle there needs to be a stamen, so I created a different shape to create the stamen. And I used the pink uh, from the diamond wood that I had had and kind of carried that into just the edges uh, of the form to kind of make it look like it was peeling back. So I was really happy with that. I even um, learned to cut acrylic and on, on the stove get it pliable enough that I could bend the leaves so that it would hold on to this piece as I wanted it. Um, and then the next one, now this was, I, I was very, this was an exciting piece. It was kind of a, a crotch between two branches that were growing together and I was hollowing through that top hole and as I was hollowing it I was exposing both sides of where the branches were coming together and, it, and both sides ended up kind of having a heart shape to them. And it was good, but the inside, you saw so much of the inside, and I'm not great at hollowing. And I'm not, it wasn't super smooth. It wasn't anything I was really uh, um, proud of in the sense of how the inside turning looked. But I got some turquoise. There were occlusions in it that I was dropping turquoise into and, and inlaying turquoise pieces into and I wanted it to look like the turquoise was coming from the inside and going out. And so I came in with a brush and very carefully on the inside used milk paint, which is a kind of a thicker paint. And so it helped smooth out some of my roughness on the inside, but it just popped as soon as I did that. And um, unfortunately, this is one of the pieces that when I sold it, I was sad to see it go. It, <laughs> I hated to, to leave it. So those were some examples of color that I've done. Um, most recently, I found an um, image on Pinterest. I'm always on Pinterest looking at different wood things, and it was a fragmented hollow form that was similar to this, and I thought, well, I have a bowl laying around that was just a plain bowl, but it was, you know, there was nothing wrong with it. It was just that it wasn't exciting to me, and it was, uh, I think this is ash, and so I was like, well, that, that ought to take stain good. And so I kind of did similar to what I did here, only stuck with three different variations of the yellow or orangish and pinkish color and did, you know, one facet at a time, kind of just went through there and got the color on it. Um, actually, that was after I had taken the Dremel tool and a bit like this which is just a boring bit, and uh, made the lines. And it, even in the example that I'd seen, it was, you know, rough, jagged lines that were cut. And I kind of thought, that, that looked cool. Well, while I was doing it, my son said, it kind of looks like, when I was starting it, he said, it kind of looks like a turtle. And I, whoa, when that kind of clicked in my head. And I said, okay, well, I got another bowl. And so... I took the bowl and created a turtle shell out of it. Um, again, it was a it was a finished product, and I was happy with it. But it wasn't that exciting. But this adds a lot of interest to it just by some a uh, little bit of Dremel work, a little bit of acrylic paint, and some stain. And so this one was a finished bowl before I started. This one I finished. So this one has a big foot on it. Um, and I had to kind of work around that a little bit with my pattern and everything. So the next time I tried it, um, this was cherry. I had a nice piece of cherry, no cracks or anything. And I just made a very small foot on it so that I could kind of tie in that, that pattern a little bit more. But again, it was just kind of a fun way to apply some color and, and simple pattern, simple thing to, you know, just draw out, hand draw out. Um, left the inside plain cherry. So that's kind of been my applications, different kinds of ways that I've used color. If you want to go to the next one, I'll show you some examples of texture. This was a Jacoba, I think was it? Jacoba wood. And if you go to the next one, Mel, it shows kind of that edge. When I first turned this platter without that texture in it, it was kind of boring and put that texture in there in between the black lines and it kind of really popped it out and, and, and so just that little bit of added 
touch but again it was it looked fine before I started putting the texture on it so it was kind of a leap to, to say okay I'm gonna <laughs> start messing with this and hope it looks okay when I'm done. What are the black lines? The black lines were just uh, they were painted and then I turned it after the, it had been painted so I turned the, the grooves or, or turned down below that and then came back and added the stipple on it. Um, if you go to the next one uh, this was a, <laughs> a piece I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but I was playing around and, and made a hollow form with a lid that I ended up carving a corkscrew into the top of it and it looked like an ice cream cone, so I decided that I was going to carve the cone shape into it. Uh, definitely is different. <laughs> Next one, Mel. Okay, this is a nice big bowl that, uh, again, I was really happy with the bowl, but uh, I was giving it away to my sister-in-law, and she is a big Coca Pelli uh, fan. So if you go to that next one, it'll show you what I did on the inside. A little bit of inlay, a little bit of wood perning. Um, you know, I trace, I, I can trace images. I, I'm fairly decent at drawing, so I don't think I trace these, but I, it's easy to find something that you like trace it and then uh, put that onto your piece. I usually, I'll take a piece of uh, onion skin is what I call it, but it's trace paper. And once I've drawn it out, then I'll go on the back side and I'll take my pencil and just put a bunch of graphite on the back side where my lines are and then come back and put it on my piece and draw it like, over it again. And it kind of puts enough of a line that I can redraw it then on the piece, but it's an easy way to replicate. Go to the next one. Uh, this is a winged bowl that I did, and <laughs> this one was kind of funny. So I, I did it, and then I decided, well, I can make a design around it, and, and it's really a repeated design. So I did one quarter of it, and then just carried that one quarter all the way around. Um, this one I put in a contest, and the contest was in regards to what you love about Lenexa. I'm from Lenexa, and there was an art contest there, uh, the Heart of Lenexa, or Art of Lenexa contest. And you should have seen the three quarters of a page description of what I gave, is how I tied that to the uh, city and the lines, the dots were the people and the lines were the tr paths they traveled and the center was the city center. Um, I had all kinds of things going on and, and it was all after the fact to make it work for that. <laughs> so I not only embellish on my wood, I embellish on my stories too. <laughs> the next one, Mel. Uh, just another bowl. It was a uh, um, chip bowl with a center that I uh, made for my sister and, and carved some oak leaves. It was a piece of oak and so I carved oak leaves and, and branches going around it. Um, she usually has it more on display than she has it using it, so I guess that's good. Next one, Mel. Okay, you all have seen something like this. It's a uh, thin, thin turned, I guess they call that a wing bowl too got done with it and I really, I, you know, it was a nice piece, it was nice and thin, uh, had a nice small bowl on the inside, but the bowl size was too small in my mind for the size of the piece, and so to embellish it I went in and, and created a sun pattern and wood burned into that, and I think it really then sets off that center, that center uh, circle there. Next one, Mel. This was one that I started out with, and my goal, uh, my goal here, so the piece of wood that it's setting on was, was a piece that I started with. It was longer than it was wide, and so I turned a circle, uh, or turned a bowl out of it that had edges on it, and then decided I was going to try to make a uh, rope type look in it, and ended up looking more like croissants on the end, but it was still fun. I think I gave that one away to my secretary. <laughs> Next one, Mel. This was a, uh, it started out as a five-sided winged bowl, I guess you would call it. And uh, I actually, before I turned it, had cut the, the tips of the, of the flower in and then came back and carved on one edge of that 
so that it kind of created that floral look. Um, and then if you go to the next one, I also, I added color to that and then I also textured the backside of it. And um, on the next slide, you'll see kind of, this was my end result. Those are popping out of a vase. One of them has absolutely no color. Um, the other one has a whole lot of color. Um, and then I took some pieces of veneer that were a light veneer and dropped them in some green. Um, it was a figured maple veneer and I dropped it in some green dye and cut some thin leaves out of it and uh, I think I got an award for that at, a, at an art contest and actually sold that one to a uh, friend from work. Next one, this I wanted to show you, this is kind of how I start. I create a shape and leave a band around it and then on that band I will kind of draw out generally the shape that I want. That's the red lines that you're seeing there and then go to kind of each individual leaf you have to kind of decide well what's what's in front and what's in back and and then start uh, carving away and creating some relief um, by kind of really diving in on your edges um, real fast and then that kind of ultimately if you go to the next one so this is me as I get the pattern going and then I, the next one will show you kind of my end result where I added some color to it. I had a band up at the top of this piece. This was actually a two-piece um, bowl or, or two-piece vase that, that came together and it seemed right above the line of, of leaves there and, and my goal was to get that seam as, as good as possible so it would go away. Um, it turned out really nice, I thought. Uh, go to the next one. Okay, this is an example of what we're going to be um, demonstrating tonight, or I'm, I'm hoping to get through a demonstration for you tonight, and it's called the Jerusalem Stone Pattern. And if you go to the next slide, it shows a little bit more close up. So you get, you get texture uh, from your Dremel tool. Um, and then I've used acrylic paint, I use a dark base paint, and then I add three metallic colors building up to create kind of this overall stone look. I think that's actually a picture of this, this particular bowl. Um, the, the technique can also be taken to a round object, so this is something I turned just the other day so that I could bring it to a demo to say it doesn't always have to go on a platter, it can be on about any kind of thing that you want. One thing that I would tell you is if you're doing a bowl, and I'll show you an example um, I learned on this one. This was just, okay, so I cut out a leaf out of, um, or maybe two, two different leaf shapes out of cardboard and then just took them and, and I had a band going around the bowl that I was starting with. And then I just kind of flopped them around and traced the outline of them and maybe inverted them and, and flipped them over and then started carving. And again, it's just a matter of what, what's on top and what's down below and really crowding those edges, really kind of diving in. <coughs> you don't have to go deep, but you got you to gotta make a contrast of this height to that height to give it that, that depth. But what I noticed was when it sets, you, you lose a lot of your carving. The only place that I display this is up on a mantle so that you're actually seeing the carving because of where I put that. And so on a form like this, you always want to be kind of up in the upper shoulder so that you're, you're, it visually is, it, you're, you're seeing more of it than if it tucks down under. Um, this is an example where I was trying to use texture to hide a really obnoxious crack that goes down the side here and I thought I can make it go away if I do the do do some texture on it I had done that before wasn't overly excited about the end result but I brought it so that I could show you that you can use texturing techniques in order to hide features that you don't want shown in your wood um, it could have been an occlusion or something that I was trying to tuck in there. We usually have a pumpkin carving contest at our uh, office every year. And carving to me is wood. Um, although I did turn a pumpkin last year, 
I just had to find a really round one and make sure that I didn't go too deep and um, had stripes all the way down then I carved a face into it and when you uh, put the uh, torch in it the, all the lines lit up and the face came out it was pretty fun um, this is an example here of a box that I, I had done it was an off, offset turning uh, demo that I had done the box lid is terrible it didn't fit very good I actually used tape to make it a little bit bigger so it at least hold on so I decided okay well that gives me something to play around with and I don't know if you can see, but I kind of got a uh, checkerboard pattern going there that I started with, and that's all in the direction that I was using the texturing Dremel tool, um, going this way on this one and going that way on that one, and then coming over with a burner and just very lightly burning so that it, it would kind of burn the top edges off of some of them. And then I turned it and did a little bit tighter pattern of the same thing, same way, but it just kind of made it more interesting than it was even though as far as a box I'm not real happy with it um, Valentine's Day comes around every year and I'm always like what am I gonna do what am I gonna do well I saw a piece this was setting in our shop there were several pieces of box elder and I saw that one streak going there and I thought I'm gonna use that and so in this piece I had a band going around it and I knew exactly where the color was popping so that's where I kind of created my feature and so what I was trying to do was uh, create two bleeding hearts is what I wanted um, and then you know most of my carving that I'm doing here is done with a craftsman chisel or a, a chisel you know um, I don't have a lot of carving tools although my wife did set me up with a set of palm carvers that are kind of nice they're not real expensive but they get you in some tight spots that I can't get in with the uh, with the chisel so I use that a lot um, like having one of these blocks around to sharpen my chisel I have not figured out a good way because I'm not a carver I have not figured out a good way to sharpen the carving tools so I just kind of work with them. Um, I saw a vase shape when I was at a client's office that it was a pottery piece, but it, I liked the shape and I liked the form that it had and it was probably closest to like this here. And I tried several pieces to kind of repeat a similar type shape and they were nice. I, I, I thought they turned out good, but then I decided I'm going to take a texture that you wouldn't typically see on a piece of wood. And so I went to a jungle cat theme. And so this is my, ti actually this is tiger stripes. This was my cheetah. Um, oh, actually this was my cheetah. This was my leopard. And all of them was just looking at images and kind of saying, well, it's kind of like this. I didn't worry about, am I exactly right? In fact, when I got done with this, it looked as much like a morel mushroom as it did anything else, you know. <laughs> and I think it had to do with the scale that I, I wasn't putting enough space in between the lines. But I was still having fun. This is my zebra pattern. So I did it so that it was this would be the spine of the zebra and this is where the back legs would have come out. I was kind of looking at a, a zebra rug that I found an image of. But just a way to set apart, you know, if you saw this before I started, I did do just a little bit of carving to accentuate these lines coming up here. And then I added a little bit of color on those edges just to kind of draw your eye to those edges and just draw your eye into it. Um, nothing highly skilled, um, just taking an idea and running with it. And again, you know, I, I, when I was done with this little piece that I had turned before I did anything to it, it was a nice little piece. It had the shape that I wanted. So to take that next step was kind of like, well, do I really want to do that? Yeah, let's do it. So I had, uh, I think, uh, had some fun doing that. Um, 
This was a piece of cherry that I turned. I turned it real thin, but it's, it's, it had a band. And so I looked up cherry blossoms and, and created a pattern of cherry blossoms that was about four or five leaves. And then went around and drew those out, flipped it over, drew some more, flipped it over, and then created some branches kind of running through it. And uh, I thought that turned out pretty fun when, when it was all said and done. Again, very simple. I, I tried to stay, if you stay with natural shapes, you don't have to be as perfect because nat nature is, is free flowing and free forms. Um, this is a platter where I had went through the bottom uh, of the platter, but I love the piece of wood that I was working with. This is a piece of black acacia I picked up at a sale one time and I, w I was heart sick when, when I went through the bottom of it. And I didn't really actually puncture it. I saw this little line and I'm like, what's that line? And then I realized, oh, that's a crack right around where the, the uh, chuck was holding on to it. And so it was gone. And Anthony Harris, you all know Anthony probably, um, he was there when I did it and he said, well, you can make a plug. And he goes, he was talking about a plug that would, would bubble out from the center. And I, so I created it and I put it in there and then I saw it. It was okay, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted. This was a piece of hickory. I think it was actually green. This was really dry, but, um, did a simple pattern. I mean, that's, that's a duplication of one leaf eight times around around a circle, um, and and really I think it's one of my favorite pieces now, even though it started out as a mistake. Um, um, no, I'm going to keep going on that because we probably need to get into the actual. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and this is just a wider pattern. I got more, more lines around it. Uh, what, I went the whole rim of, of, the, of the platter with lines as opposed to just two or three. If you go to the next one. These are the tools I use. I've got two, two Dremel bits. One's, uh, let's see. I use this bit. This, I don't know if you can see that shape very well or not, but that bit is the one that I'll, I'll do vertical lines and it, it, it's flat on the end. So if I hold it at a 45, it kind of creates a V cut. And that's what I'm after with that bit. And then I stipple with this rounded tip bit and all I'm doing there is is little dots they have different sizes and different uh, depths. Is that what you did that one bowl with? Um, one that had the, the rim of just nothing but little dimples all the way around? Yes, yes, and yes because because I learned kind of started it on this, this pattern. So tonight we're going to talk about the, what I don't know if this is the true name of it, but it uh, was told to me that it's called the Jerusalem Stone Pattern. And basically, I've, I've, you're creating your, you're cutting your horizontal lines. In this case, it, if I start with this platter, it would be these lines here are cut with a, I usually use a skew. Um, you could use a diamond tip any kind of tool, but I, I go about 16th of an inch down. And then what, I, what I'll do is, um, from, from that, then I'll be cutting in with the Dremel tool, vertical lines to create a soldier course, which is just a pattern of overlapping, uh, like, like a brick wall is typically a soldier course. So, uh, what I'm gonna start with is just, and, you can get, I suppose you could measure and get pretty technical about it, um, but I usually just kind of go on the fly and find a width that I like. Can you move that over so that it's underneath it? Sorry, guys. All right. 
So um, the, the only important thing with these perpendicular lines that I'm going to be putting in is trying to keep your width kind of similar. So if I use that brush just to kind of establish my width and then try to get them to go in towards the center of the bowl. But I would go along and mark off similar distance all the way around all my lines trying to go to the center of that bowl. And I'm using a, a felt tip pen because I know that ultimately I'm going to be painting over this so I don't care. I'm going to be cutting those lines away and, and I'm going to be painting over it so it doesn't really matter. When this was demonstrated to me by Ellie Al Alvisera um, who came to our club and did a hands-on and he would burn those outer lines after he would cut he would cut the groove in and then he would take a piece of um, laminate it was a laminate sample and he would hold it down in there and, and so it would burn those lines in I found that I'm painting the whole thing after I'm done with the burning and everything that I need to do I'm going to paint over this so there was no need to burn those lines in I think it was just something else he could show us but that was nice um, so I would go in, I would kind of establish my, my brick size uh, distance between. I'd go all the way around the bowl. I don't worry too much if they're perfect. Uh, the wood burning that I'll be doing can clean some of that up if I don't have a good perpendicular line. And then I go to the next ring and just center off of that and then the other one's going to be in line with that so I'm just kinda and I'm not going to do this whole bowl because you guys don't want to be here watching me draw this all night but I'll do a little bit so you kinda get a gist of what you're doing now at this point I've already put sanding sealer, I kind of sealed it all um, so that I don't have to try to get the sanding sealer on and avoid the paint that's in the middle later. But uh, after you've painted it, you can come back with a poly spray and kind of seal it down that way too. Um, I've done, I've left it before. So let me just do a little, a few more of these tick marks because I do have a handout that kind of goes step by step on what you what you do. So if any of you are interested, there's about 10 of them up there, but I also got it to mail in a, an electronic version. So if you uh, would like it that way, I'm sure he can get it to you or post it somehow. So ultimately, that's my pattern. And the first thing I'm going to do is my Dremel work which entails just basically dremeling those perpendicular lines. And I'm going to hold this bit, like I was saying, at a 45 so that it kind of creates a V-groove just like the skew that I used kind of created a V-groove on the, on the other one. I do want to be careful that I don't touch those outside lines. And I'm also going to come in and burn these to kind of straighten things up a little bit. But all I'm doing now is dribbling away the lines that I just put on there. Trying to remember that 45 degree thing as I'm doing it. Again, staying away from this inner rim and that outer edge just because you don't want those to get cut. People usually don't don't take the time to actually measure each brick to know if you're off a little bit or not so you can kind of really freehand as much as you need to. So now, other way, 
Now I've just got those lines reestablished in between going perpendicular towards the center in a soldier course pattern. Next I'll take a round tip bit and we're going to try to get that stipple and the stipple really makes it look like stone when once it and it gives you depth it, it allows the metallic paint to kind of create a depth to it that's really good so this isn't a true round bit but it gets a round end on it which is all I need now I'm going to come in and I'm just very lightly touching different places all the way around. Just adding a little stipple pattern. I can hit corners. I try to stay away from the outer edge again, but you need to have some of the dots go out there, so you gotta kinda add some of them more careful than others. In the center, this probably is a little hard to see on the screen, but I am creating almost a golf ball like texture. Uh, sometimes I go deeper, sometimes I go lighter. That kind of helps it not look too structured. And I'm going to be burning some lines into this. And you can burn the lines before you do the stippling. I just, uh, I have the Dremel out. So I just decided that I would make that the next step instead of the burning. So I don't know how well that shows up, but I've just created kind of a, a bunch of little dots, a bunch of little dimples. Where you at? Around the edge. In, on the faces of what would be the stones. Um, then, this is where I would take a piece of Brillo pad or, or uh, something with not a lot of grit to it and sand across there just to knock down those little burrs and stuff that might have popped up there. Okay. Treated that with sanding sealer. I've already, yeah, I've already treated it with sanding sealer. Now I'm going to take my wood burner. Let me see if I, and I'm going to a chisel tip. So it's just a, a chisel chisel tip on it, and I'm just going to go and reestablish those lines that I just dremeled into it and I'm not worried about the ones that are going around the platter I'm just on these perpendicular lines and what this does is kind of makes an even chisel look to, in between each one of them like a mortar would be you got to be careful on this outer edge that you don't get into the the part you don't want to color. And ultimately I would work my way around the entire bowl just establishing those perpendicular lines. Probably doesn't have to be done but it does make some uniformity when you use the wood burner to, to kind of reestablish those, those perpendicular lines. I can kind of push it in there and get it, the depth of it and everything to kind of be similar to the depth of the grooves around there. So I would do that. I'm remembering to turn it off. Uh, I would do that all the way around the bolt. And at that point, next step is going to your painting. And I would come out with painter's tape. 
you don't do your, your uh, lines around it? No, no. They're, they're pretty uniform because you've cut them on the lay. So I, these others sometimes, uh, like if one is tilted more than I want it, I can take the wood burner and, and kind of straighten that up by, doing, by re pressing in that same groove. Um, I take usually little chunks like this, kind of take my finger now and, and figure out where my line is and then I'll take it. Sorry. Uh, so I would just keep going around the bowl on the inside and the outside. And again, I just take my finger now and find that groove. And then I would come in with an X-Acto knife and I would cut that out and I do the same on the outside. And this is just protecting the wood from the paint that you're going to be doing. Same thing, I just establish that, then I come in. And, and I, I do try to be careful how I cut that so that when I'm applying the paint, number one, I'm hoping that it doesn't seep under the tape, but I do want it to get all the way in that outside and inside groove down into it. Um, so, through the magic of television, poof, now we've went all the way around, <laughs> we've burned in the lines, we've done the dimples, we've taped it off, and we've put the base coat on, and the base coat is usually a dark color. Um, I, I used, what is this called, burnt umber. But I've also used, on some of them, I've used straight out licorice or black. Um, so it doesn't matter, just you want a dark color there to kind of establish your base. And you want to press it in real good. And if you're holding it, if you're holding it like this and you're doing it, make sure that you turn it over because you might see some exposed where you didn't get the paint down in there. So you want to make sure you kind of look at it from all angles and, and get the paint tucked down in there. But this has already been applied with a, a coat of your dark paint. So I don't have to do that step. You don't have to watch paint dry. Well, you might hear in a little bit, but uh, not too bad. And so you use acrylic paint. I so use, dyes. this is all acrylic. Yeah, and, and so I start with a, uh, I, I don't want to say flat, but just a plain paint. And then I'll come back in with three different in, in kind of build up three different uh, metallic acrylic paints. And so I start with this darker colored bronze and then I'll go actually into a silver and finish up with a gold. And, and every, you, you think, do, is it really necessary? Do I need to do all three? Probably not, but it really does add depth as you, as you build that up. So. What Ellie Alvacera told me to use, and I, this is the first time I'm going to ever get to use this because I happened to ask my wife, do you have a brush that you don't use? He said the softest brush you can find, and he said the one that I found worked was my wife's makeup brush. And she had one that was broken off or something because she was more than willing to let me, let me use it for the demo tonight. Um, Does she want it back? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I'll cut it off. Maybe cut the ends off and give it back to you. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen anything like this, but this is an old man's uh, eye saver. These are LED lights that uh, I use these when I'm when I'm doing the, that detail work and, and wanting to see my dimples and stuff that I put on it. And I'm not meaning to blind any of you in front, but I just wanted to show you. They, uh, hook up to a USB, you plug them in, they recharge, and you're ready to go again. So, fun, fun, nice item, saves my eyes. Um, I need... Where'd you get that? I, you know, she, my wife is an Amazon person, so she probably bought it on online. This is called Easy Red, is the name that's on the side of it, so I imagine if you Googled Easy Red lights, you could find them. I don't, I don't, I don't want to think that they were too expensive, but I didn't ask. <laughs> I just said, oh, I like those. She, she's a jewel, she makes jewelry. And so I was uh, trying to show her 
or I was watching her use hers and I was like, I, I want those. And so I did, she, she made sure I got them. Okay, one of the, the tricks to this is uh, when we're applying, this isn't the case with the dark, uh, with the dark wood, uh, paint, you're going to really want a brush that's going to either a thick brush that can can really get the paint in there or even one of the foam foam brushes but you want to you don't want it to build up but you want to get it on all the cracks really good but when you get to the metallic paint uh, you want a really dry brush so I'm gonna put some color on there and I'm starting again I'm starting with the bronze and then I'm going to tap it out to where it's really not really heavy. Okay, now I'm just going to kind of go around this outer edge and add my bronze color. I don't want it to be too heavy but I need to be able to see a little bit of it too and I want it to be even kind of throughout so and I don't know if you can kind of start to see some of that on on the camera there but you can see the sheen happening right so the first layer bronze, next layer silver, and you could mix this up. I, I'm going by the uh, direction that Ellie had told me, but uh, I have used silver as my last color when I wanted it to stand out from some walnut really good, and it worked really well. Again, I'm trying to get this dry enough, get enough on there that I can see it, but get it dry enough before I start tapping it on. And I want to just go around the edge again. And add my okay, silver. Wait that first coat to dry, I take it. Uh, you know, acrylics dry, and you're painting it so. Um, light that you would wait for that first dark color yeah you would want that dark base color to dry pretty well before you added more uh, or added the metallics but the metallics by the time I get around the bowl where I started is probably already dry and what you're starting to see is it'll hit that top face but it doesn't get down into those dimples so those dimples start to really start to give it some depth and start to show off kind of that stone stone look which is what I'm hoping to get out of this the nice thing about this technique is if you don't like your end result, you can just paint back over in the dark color and start over again. I mean, it's, it's, you should. You should. That wouldn't have a tendency to fill in the dimples? Um, if you got too thick, it would, but I, when I'm putting on that dark coat, I'm brushing it away pretty good and trying to clear out those dimples so that you get that variation. And I'm gonna finish up with some gold. to get a little carried away here so I try to I'd rather go light than go too much so can you see it start to pop out a little bit on the camera and I got it in, in focus there but by the time you hit that third layer you really start to see some depth and you, you get that 
pattern. You don't want to push this in far enough where you're getting into what would be the mortar around the stones, um, the, the, the low spots. But you want those top spots hit pretty good. That's it, folks. I mean, um, now the, 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 the most fun part of all is peeling it off and seeing what your end result is. Now here I've got a little bit of bleed there. With acrylics I might be able to use a little sandpaper and sand that away a little bit. If you put your finish on though you're sanding your finish away. Right, right, and it comes off the sealer really well. This one I actually didn't seal before I did, before I taped it off and, and did the other paint. I probably should have. <clears throat> so I can see where I've got a couple places where the tape didn't tape as good around the edge as possible, so I've got some bleeding. I can kind of see it right in here. It's bled out a little bit. So like Mike was saying, if, if I had put sanding sealer on it already, uh, you could almost take your fingernail and, and chisel away that, that acrylic or take a, you know, uh, you could take the chisel and, and just kind of lightly or take a little sandpaper and sand it, but be real careful not to hit your stone. But the ultimate end goal uh, is kind of that stone pattern. And this is called the Jerusalem Jerusalem stone it's about six seven steps but really makes a, it it really highlights uh, um, the rim um, I did four collection plates for my church and just did two bands uh, and was more silver on a walnut and I was telling Mel every time I I'm, I'm, I usher and, and get to take the collection plates. I'm just sitting there looking at my work. I just <laughs> I don't. I'm hoping I'm hoping everybody else is looking at my work too. But I, uh, it, it really makes me proud that, that they were done. Um, but that's it, folks. I just you know it's a new technique. You you could yeah. I would suggest a spray uh, a spray poly uh, on top of it. I wouldn't do a wipe on poly because you're probably going to wipe the acrylic. I don't know what the poly will do on a thick basis on that acrylic, but I know that the spray poly has worked. Yeah, I have a question because I've, I've been looking at this stuff too, but I read something about acrylics not getting along well with bare wood sometimes. Um, uh, do you know anything about that? I haven't had a problem with that at, at all. I mean, this was all painted into bare, you know, these lines were all painted into bare wood. I haven't had, you know, a big... I, I, I figure what I'm reading is big time industrial production or something. That could be. Um, it does, it, it, it is helpful if you've already got that sanding sealer on it so that you do have kind of a you know, nice slick surface that is great. And, and I, I think it kind of holds to it a little it may bit have better. To do with the moisture content in the wood, too. Yes, that, that probably has as much as anything as if it is wet wood. I probably wouldn't start a putting paint or applying a paint to a, a wood that I, you know, didn't have down to 15 or 11 percent, you know, kind of moisture rate. Your, your but, sanding seal you put on there, do you, do you cut it before you... I, I, I've put the outer lines... No, I mean the, 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 the sanding sealer itself. Do you cut it with like alcohol or anything? Or I, I don't. I, I just go straight now. That's before I've put any of the acrylic on, though. Mm -hmm. So it's at... Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, it's, it's at this stage. That's already sealed, and, and so that acrylic will, will grab hold of that sealer that's really well. That's just straight sanding sealer. That's just straight that's standing that. sealer. I haven't put any poly or anything on it yet. Gotcha. Um, what colors are your... By nine. Green bolt that's standing up there. What colors did you use on it? On this one, yeah. uh, same three colors. Uh, started. I think I used a black base though instead of the burnt umber. 
so and um, it'll diff it'll vary if you're going to do multiples that you want to look alike do them all at the same time have them all at the at the point where you're doing the one color on all of them and then doing the next color on all of them and doing the next color on all of them and uh, simple process really once he showed me I was like oh I got to do that um, something I want to try sometime is creating a void and then making it look like there's brick on a lower level but I, that would mean that I'm going to have to cut these horizontal lines with a Dremel probably a disc type piece to cut those and and then you know like a brick wall that the uh, plaster has started to fall off of and you're seeing the brick exposed through it, I'd like to do that in a bowl sometime or in, in the side of an object of some sort. But my goal was to be done by 9. It's 9 o'clock, so I'm going to call that good unless there's other questions, guys. You can clean that brush out, can't you, and use it again? Oh, yeah, I just... <laughs> uh, I just probably just clip off the end and I could use it again easily enough but yeah acrylic you know you put acrylic in a little bit of water and soap and acrylic washes out of brushes really easy so I hope you learned something from that and I hope that was a okay demo for you guys <laughs>